There are two answers from you. The first answer is your personal opinion about the intuition, and another one is the uh, answer of all those people that you interview about the intuition. It is the ability to really be flexible to change your mind. How did he manage to go back? Somebody's a really bad interviewer, the worst interviewers in the world. Oh, you know what happened? You're talking, this is good. I would kind of think of myself as a medium sized fish in uh, my childhood. Uh, one of the reasons for success. He just had this inner feeling that he could do it. I'm just a regular guy. Uh, I'm no one, I have no education. When I look back, I said, how could I have missed that? How could I have missed that? Harry Kaufman is the reason I became a book, you know, writer, a, a writer of books. I started with the $2,000 and lost them all because of a single large loss. Oh, That's no. the next question. Yeah, Thank okay. you. I want you to read it. Yeah, right. A trait that is a central grade the ability to be flexible. Exactly. Hello. Thank you, first of all. Thank you very sure. much. It's very kind. Well, you came all the way out here, so Let's no big deal. You're the person who deserves. Yeah. So, you know, the, 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 the questions uh, are going to be simple, but something would you like and you know. Uh, first question is usually because a lot of people, they start to ask the question, asking us the questions. I mean, I'm just a regular guy. Uh, I'm no one, have no education. How would I begin an industry? So my question is to you about your childhood. My childhood? Education. You know, nothing very Just I grew up, you know, you know the year I grew up. I grew Brooklyn, up in Brooklyn. By, yeah. the way, by the way, guys. Yeah, so I mean, nothing. In the, yeah, very uninteresting childhood. Uh, education was in economics. Uh, I did go to Brooklyn College, um, which, which was an excellent university. And I also went afterwards, I went to graduate school in Brown. And I always tell people, listen, I'm not joking. I said I got a better education in Brooklyn College than I got than I had in Brown. Seriously? Seriously? Yeah, I uh, thought you was were major? back at uh, economics, minor in math. But uh, at least when I went to it, I'm thinking it's still probably a good school. But back in those days, it was a fairly competitive school, and uh, it was excellent. You know, so and and I went to college. You know, it was you know no. Uh, I had no, it was, well, it was a small expense, but I had a scholar, I had a New York State scholarship, so it really, had, college cost me nothing. What was the first job? The oh. first job was a research analyst. You know, if, a position that doesn't exist anymore, I, I don't believe. I was. Oh, a, I think they do. I was, a, I was a commodity research analyst. I don't know, a fundamentals, on the fundamental side. So I don't know if that position even exists. The weather exists. report and everything else. Well, not so much a weather report, yeah, but you know, supply, demand, so economics. report. Uh, the, was that COT reports? Yeah, yeah. I mean, basically, you know, the government reports, but also projections. And but the bottom line is, you're still trying to project prices. So essentially, a fundamental, fundamental analyst projecting commodity prices and working for a brokerage firm. And I don't believe brokerage firms have that. I don't believe that position exists anymore. Maybe it does, but it's certainly pretty rare. I think if it exists at this point. So the the the, the first job. You basically fell in love. Well, I liked the, yeah, I mean, it was, um, what I liked about it was uh, that there was no, I wanted something that was analytical and I wanted something that was non-repetitive. I didn't want to do the, the same thing every day. And so the markets are always changing, you know, so, so it's not repetitive and, and you had to be, and you had to be original. And also when I got into the business, at least the research I thought was pretty awful. So. You didn't have to. I, I I would kind of think of myself as a medium-sized fish in a, you know, right. in a in a pond with a lot of small fish. It wasn't that I I was so great, but everything all the other research was was pretty pathetic. So, um, you know, I saw an area I thought I could get ahead, and that was interesting, and it was analytical, and I never left basically. Basically, it's very interesting uh, what you just said. Uh, it's when you. Uh, was reading the other people what they wrote. You understand that you can do much better, so you start to do a better job. That's what I thought. I mean, yeah. I mean, it sounds you know, conceited, but it wasn't so much. Why? Well, no, no. I thought it was conceited, but I just didn't think that the quality of the work was, was very good, and um, and nor did I think there was any really good books out there. And so, uh, well, I had been working at that point. Probably I was in the industry for about thirteen years, but I didn't think there were really any good. Analytical text on come on futures, and so that's when I wrote that first you know guide to the futures markets, complete guide, and I wrote it because I 
I thought, hey, there's not a really good book out there. You know, I should do one. So I took a sabbatical and I did it. Then the, the another question. Uh, there's a bunch of people who basically they know uh, they could do much better than others. So the question is, uh, there's millions of people who wants to write the book. Sure. You, wrote, you wrote the book. Uh, how did you see the demand on it and whatever? Who inspired you besides you? And whatever, who asked you? I, mean, I, I never, I never had any thoughts or any plans to be a writer. I mean, I never that that wasn't in my career objective. It sort of just happened. Well, what happened was, I I started writing back. Now it's called, I think, Modern Trader. It used to be called for a long time. It's called Futures, and before Futures was called Commodities. I mean, there was original the original magazine on commodities and. Uh, they started about 1971, pretty much very about the same time I started in the business. And um, I kind of, you know, I got the magazine and I said, you know, I could do this. So I called them up and said, hey, you know, I'd like to write for you. So I ended up in the early years, I was a contributing editor for Commodities Magazine. So that gave me kind of some visibility in the writing and also got me into writing. And that from doing that and also I was always writing research reports. So then it wasn't a very big step to thinking about writing a book. I actually wrote the book without having a publisher. I mean, I just, I figured, you know, I just took a year off. I wrote it. And um, I think at which point I got, at some point after I'd done maybe a good chunk of it, I, oh, you know what happened? You're talking, this is good. Because you were talking, you just saw Perry Kaufman. I told you Perry Kaufman and I go back a long time. Well, Perry Kaufman back, this is how, actually, it's Perry. Now I remember, think about it. See, now it's a beautiful, we're having yeah. a conversation. So now, Perry Kaufman is the reason I became a, book, you know, writer, a writer of books. After we finish, we're going to call Perry and say, No, it's not that, that, that's, no, it's his, not that he, not that he encouraged me, but he was, he was definitely the catalyst. And were it not for Perry, who knows I would have written the first book. And you want to go a step further, if I hadn't done that first book, I may, I a good chance I never would have gotten around to writing the other books either. So Perry Calvin was doing this um, encyclopedia of, of Commodities. I feel something like that. I don't think that was a, the handbook. I think called it Handbook of Commodity Markets. And you talk about he's doing a new 1300 page book. That was like a 1500 page book. But he was the editor. And for every subject, he called somebody he knew in the, in the industry who was, you know, expert. For advice. And so back in, you know, many early days, I started out as fundamental and you know, as a fundamental analyst. So, so he said, Jack, I'm doing this thing. I'd like you to write, I'd like you to write the chapter in fundamentals. I said, okay. As I started writing, I started writing. And you know, after a while, I'm looking, I got 80 pages and I'm nowhere near done. I just knew too much about fundamental analysis. So I, 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 I called Perry up. I said, look, Perry, you know, I'm sorry, but this is just turning out. I, I've kind of written like a third of my own book. And that's what I thought. I thought 80 pages would have been a third. It turned out it was more like 10%, but I didn't know that at the time. Um, but that's what I, so I, I said, look, I'll, I'll narrow the subject down. I'll give you, how about if I do a chapter on, I took some very specific subject, right. might have been something about performance analysis or, to, uh, or whatever. And I said, I'll do a chapter on that and you can use that and, you know, and he was fine and that's, that's what happened. Um, a lot of uh, phrases I took uh, from your book. So this would be a lot of times the people they have uh, read something somewhere and then they ask the questions and most of the time this is not correct information so right from your book you said i started with the two thousand dollars and lost them all because of a single large loss right right from your book so tell me more about it because you know the, b besides you being an order of uh, uh, a lot of books you're a trader yeah and that's what interested me the most because of uh, our uh, uh, audience they basically the traders so they want to know so you started with $1,000, lost them all because of the large single loss. I know you added up more money there yeah, yeah. into your account. Well, I mean, so this, I think it's a trade. So um, this goes back, this is actually a good lesson, not so much for trading, but uh, from statistics and uh, just general analysis guidelines. And people do make this mistake all the time. You can't draw conclusions when there isn't sufficient data, Fish. right? So it turns out I did the whole analysis and this also, ties back to Michael Marcus, who, who, who was the first interview I did for Market Wizards. And uh, Michael Marcus, when I got into the business, the job that was vacated, the research analyst job, that was Michael's position. He was leaving 
to become a trader, and that opened up the vacancy, and I ended up, you know, ending up with that job. So we met when I was going in, and he was going out, and he was in New York for a few years, and we used to get together for lunch, and you know, every few weeks. So I remember this market very well, and so it was back in the early 70s, and I did this analysis, and I first of all, I understood is that I analyzed every single year since the World War II of the, uh, of the cotton market. And uh, I understood that maybe with the exception of three or four years, what really determined the price in every year was the government program. Because there was a lot of cotton, the government had a loan program. So basically, whatever the loan level was, it didn't make a difference whether it was, there was too much supply, and if you have too much supply in a, in a support level, it's going to go to the support level, and that's it. So there were only about three or four years to work on. And this particular year, uh, it had the fundamentals were bullish, and, and there was only one of a year that was comparable. And this was even maybe even more bullish in that year. I think cotton had gone, the highest level had gone in the 20th century, which was like uh, low 30s. Cotton was around 20, mid 20s. I thought, well, it's going to go up. It'll, it'll go up to that old price, and but that should be about it. So I was originally bullish. I made some money. But then I, when I got into the, to the oil price and higher, and it's and the markets they, that all started looking like it was stopping, whatever, I thought, you know, I was trying to pick a top, you know, so I got short. And um, and so, the, by the way, Marcus, uh, who hadn't done any fundamental work, didn't do anything, but he was just a great intuitive trader, just had tremendous instincts. And he was very, very bullish on cotton. And I remember all you know, arguing from, you know, the third argument, and his thing was, well, the, the, you know, the PRC China then called, was the, China was then called the PRC, People's right. Republic of China. He said China's coming into the, the as an importer in a significant way, the first time ever. And he understood that if that was the, out of the hundred fundamentals, that was the only one that made a difference. Now I knew about China as a buyer, but I said, you know, I got that in my statistics, but I didn't understand that because it was new and because there was an unknown amount that they could buy, that that would be the driving force. And he understood that. So he was bullish all along. Cotton, by the way, that year went to 99 cents. So, oh, the, okay. so the smartest thing, the luckiest thing, and the smartest thing is that I only had 2000. You know, so I lost my winnings and I lost to 2000. And it's a, for, a good thing that I, you know, I didn't have more money and right. that I only, and it's also a good thing that I only, you know, I only started a very small amount. So that was the trade. Uh, that was a, you know, that was like kind of the, uh, um, and certainly a lesson that, you only need to be wrong if you don't have risk managers. You only need to be wrong once you knock out a market. That also instilled in me probably that experience instilled in me like a, an extreme cautiousness, which stayed to me even to this day. Um, so whenever I start, and I don't, I don't trade all the time. I trade. I go in spurts. I trade. I don't trade. Um, and the determination of that is well, I always do the same thing. I always, when I go back to trading, I always start for small amount. And I have amount that I'm willing to lose, and if I lose that, I'm out. And if I keep on winning, I keep on trading until, until you know, until I start giving back substantial amounts, uh, which is always still when I'm well ahead. But I've given back, and once that happens, I, I just wait. I quit, and then, and then I wait till I feel till I get a real urge to start trading again. And uh, you know, a lot of it can be a while because it's a lot of times I could get a lot of stuff. It takes time. I don't, I don't feel like trading. I got too many other things to do. I'm too busy. And so I don't think, you know, but that's how that's, that's been my process actually from that very first time. And it's advice I actually give to trade, especially new traders. The first of all, said always start small because odds are like myself and like even a lot of the traders I interviewed, you're going to probably lose in the beginning. So if you're going to lose, you might as well get your education without so much money, you know. Pay as little as possible. Yeah, right. So, so I always advise people to start small. And the other advice I have is, is, you know, no, you know, when you're, when you do get ahead, have some sort of level where you'll pull the plug. Because too many people do, you know, they'll make money, they'll get the, you know, they'll, maybe they'll do it right, maybe they'll be lucky, whatever, but they end up giving it all back and then lose, you know. So yeah. if you have a, if you have a, if you have a spot where you know you'll get out, and the idea of getting out is, because look, if you're starting to lose significant money, some something is wrong. You're out of sync with the markets. Something is wrong. Something you got reasons. Um, actually, it's another tangent I'll get to in a second. But you got reasons for losing 
that um, maybe psychological, whatever, and and you keep on trading, you're just going to throw it, it all away. Support. You're going to throw it all away. So you might have, so if you have a spike, say, if I lose this much, I'm out, I'm out, and that's it. And then you can always get back in if you feel, but you'll come in with a clean slate and with a clean mind and with no positions to call your your objectivity. And it's not like you're saying I'll never trade again, but you're just and you just saying, okay, I'm still ahead. Let me take what I have. I'll start trading again, but something's wrong now. Now's not, you know. By the way, you see, the beautiful part is about the conversation, how we will we understand each other. The Marcus is the next. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, hey, well, I'll tell you, when I did my books, I would have a stack of index cards. And if oh, I, I love it. And if I did the interview, and I never, I wouldn't use it. I just had it. It was a crutch. And when I finished the interview, you know, whatever you were winding up, I said, do you mind? And can we just flip through these cards see if I missed anything? And almost invariably, I had nothing left. I basically hit everything. So if you have a regular conversation, odds are you'll basically hit everything you want to hit anyway. And it becomes, it's much more natural that way than, Correct. than if you go and you have just you know, questions. And I've had into, you know, sometimes see, somebody's a really bad interviewer. The worst interviewers in the world are, uh, are the ones that have, first of all, they have a list of questions and they're going to ask the questions in the order they have them. And they ask the question in the same way, no matter what the other person said. Right. So the best stuff I ever got on my interviews were never from the question so much. It's one thing leads to another and tangent goes to tangent. And then you get the heart of the matter. But if you're just going to come in with a prepared question, you'll get pat answers. Michael Mark was the person who originally lost his mother money early in his trading career, later went out to turn $30,000 into $80 million in yeah. 12 years. Yeah. Well, in on four, I, I think it may have been over 10 or 12 years. 12 years. 12 years, yeah. Yes, yeah 12 true. years. That's right. a, everything I do from... Yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah, if it was 12 years in the book, it's so, exactly... I mean, it's a very... It's 12 years, yeah. It's very interesting for us. Yeah, and, and reason he, we want people to know, honestly. Yeah. Everything is possible. Now, it's a little, it's a little misleading, the 30,000, 80 million, because it's really that they were taking out 20% a year. So it's actually much more. Uh -huh. Because he was working for Commodities Corp and they were taking, you know, yeah. they were taking 20% out of his. So actually, he really, it's not only the growth from 30 to, to 80. Although at one point early year, they did put in 100 in, but they took out so many tens of millions. That uh, so his 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 actually his actually growth was greater than just from thirty to eighty million, uh, unbelievably. Yeah. Uh. So the, the, so there were years he would, there were years there he had straight years where he was making tr high triple digit returns. I mean, just extraordinary. Part of that, of course. We're talking about the, in in eighties. In the set, well, the seventies. Seventies, yeah. So let's so, talk about Marcus Moore. Yeah. Because if you refer to him many many times. You know, I understand. You have something like uh, click together. Well, no, but we knew each other. We were friends, and you know, uh, you know, kind of. I is there's the irony that connects us is that his leaving to become a trader opened up a position which got me into this business. Had I not, I wasn't looking to be. I wasn't looking to go into future commodities, what we then call commodities. Uh, I wasn't even looking to go into Wall Street in any shape or form, and I knew nothing about. It zero about futures at the time. I just had some analytical skills. That's it. I, 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 so I ended up in that job only because of fate that he left it at the exact time I was looking for a position. And his boss happened to look in a newspaper where I put an ad looking for a position, called me in for an interview, and that led to the job. So for one thing, I'm in the business because he left the street up to become a trader. So that's that connection. Right. But then we, we continued on for a few years and, uh, and uh, we had that connection, and of course, he became ch the first chapter of the Market Wizards book. So it, it's that uh, there were a number of those things that why maybe he would stand out more than other people for that for those reasons. Uh, besides the fact, of course, that uh, just an extraordinary type, you know, extraordinary accomplishment. Also, he was even though he was extremely reluctant to do the interview, he was what I consider probably one of the best interviews across all the books that I ever had. And it was a reason why you can always tell which, which, um, not always, because sometimes the length dictates uh, it not be. But what I put as the first chapter is always a chapter I like a lot. Because I think it's very important people start reading a book. 
That's so, what begins. So whatever chapter I put first is, if it's not my favorite chapter in the book, it's, it's you know, it's right. And, and in Marcus's case, that was my favorite interview. Uh, might have been my favorite interview ever, I don't know. But what I like so much about it was he was honest, he was very honest. Even though he was very, he was extremely reluctant to do it, but once he started talking, That's he was very honest, very open. I don't think you can find a more just complete open person, you know, testament of the experience of a trader that Marcus gave me in that interview. He, you know, he didn't color anything. He didn't make himself look good in any way. He put it all out there, all, you know, all, all the hardships and all the giant mistakes that were made early on that are all there. So um, I like that aspect and I'm sort of made for a very colorful interview. So, uh, so that's, that's, that's another reason why I particularly uh, like liked like that, yeah. When the person is losing money and he had like very hot heat because you know, you know, when we lose the parents' money, I mean, this is a much harder than to lose your own money. So when he lost it, I mean, and you talk to him, how did he manage to go back? Because the thing that Marcus had, uh, one of the reasons for success, he just had this inner feeling that he could do it. He had this phenomenal, there, there are different types of traders, okay? Um, people, people succeed as traders, they don't always succeed for the same reason, you know, like you, like you could have... Uh, you see it? <laughs> you don't understand, look at this. <laughs> That's the next question. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. They they succeed for different reasons. Like you have like different types of artists who may become great artists now. They they succeed for different they might they may become great artists for different reasons. Great writers may they, they could be great writers, but they become great writers in completely different ways. Uh so uh it's not because they're similar in their approach, but they're both great in their own way. Like, you know, I don't know. Something like Dostoevsky and George Orwell will take two names off the top of my head. Right. There's nothing really in common necessarily about the style of the writing or, or what they wrote about or, or anything else, but they're both, they're both great writers. So, so it's not that they had necessarily the same types of insights or skills or passions or whatever, but each had that, their own specific type of talent. So traders have the same, the same thing. It's like some traders, are like somebody like a like an Ed Thorpe. Ed Thorpe is an absolute absolute genius. You know, off the uh, off the charts. God knows what his IQ is. I have no idea, but I'll tell you, it's probably five standard deviations out. So he he's he's an absolute genius. Okay, uh, so he continually figured out ways that Wall Street inefficiencies in the market, and he continually found ways to exploit them. So he was the first one to figure out convertible arb, the first one to figure out stat arb. When stat arb, regular stat arb became popular, he figured out changes to make it work. He just continually kept inventing processes and all quant, all quant, and a lot of it heavy math, develops the Black-Scholes model. Mm -hmm. Mathematics wasn't called the Black-Scholes because he developed it, but he developed his own and really mathematically equivalent uh, method of uh, pricing options years before they published it as a paper. So this is a true out genius, pure quant power. That's an example. Somebody with very special skill and applying it to the markets. Purely quant though. Something like Marcus is on the complete opposite end. Mark, I mean, even me <laughs> doing like economic analysis was a high quant guy, you know, to Marcus, you know. I want to hear two answers from you. The first answer is your personal opinion about the intuition. And another one, it's the uh, answer of all those people that you interview about the intuition. Yeah, I, I think it's probably might be the same, uh, but I'll put it in my own words because I don't necessarily remember what I the, need your words. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't necessarily remember exactly the answers that other people gave me, but I think it would be in, it would be consistent. Uh, but the way I would phrase it is intuition is something that's very misunderstood. People think, oh, intuition is something I, like... I think the bolt is going to go it's, up. It's not intuition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a sort of this amorphous thing. Like, comes into your mind. It's like, uh, it's like people who are superstitious and they, uh, or, you know, they're going to bet, they go, they, they buy a lottery ticket and they, they bet their kids, you know, birthdays and they think, you know, whatever. And then they win and then, oh my God, you know, so that's not intuition. Intuition is not like that. It's not something that is, 
what what is intuition and i very very simple so and, I, and i'm logically scientifically oriented i don't believe in any of the other stuff um it's very simple you if you're a trader a particular trader like marcus who's watching the markets to god knows 15 hours a day for 20 years whatever number of years it was at the time but you see like hundreds of thousands maybe millions of situations right um it's not like you have it's not like your big uh, blue you know whatever the ibm computer so and, and, and that you can kind of get these you know look up the thing and find a path but in your mind you, you think something all of a sudden you think something's going up um and you're not sure even why you see it and you feel it yeah you you you, you said this market is going higher you don't know why or lower basically but what what's really happening in all likelihood is you've seen that situation before probably multiple times and when and particularly if it's counterintuitive particularly if it's illogical it it made more of an impression because like let's say a really bearish news item comes out and you think the and market's going to crash down. and the market goes up same like happened with the and you start last see, time this will be seen with trump that yeah, everybody that's everybody, the classic that and i and i said, of, I said it right and, away and i can't believe when i look <laughs> back maybe i was maybe i was so upset that trump you know and i don't mind saying you know it's okay you no know, no i don't mind saying but, I'm but maybe i was so upset that that trump won that i wasn't able to think clearly but but that when i look back is that how could i have missed that how could i have missed that everybody thought, I said, I said everybody that everybody thought that you know trump you know trump is yeah and, and the market before that every time trump uh Trump was, you know, uh, looked like he was doing better. The market, oh, the market went down. Did. Absolutely. And as soon as he won, it started tanking. And then the markets reversed and started going up. They totally, they totally put out everything. I said, right, right away, I said, market is going to fly. And that's the classic. That's the absolute classic example. So the, it's classic because, you know, you, of course, you took out all the stops, number one. But the more the expectations were so one sided, and the market initially goes that way for a fake and then goes the other way. Out of all of those people that you interview, and besides that, the, for the first book, second book, uh, what they have in common, and uh, what was special about them, at least, like, if you can point a few guys. I mean, we, we talk about Marcus, uh, uh, we, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe Schwartz or uh, somebody. So what they have in common, because 100%, I'm sure those people have something in common. Well, they had tons of things in common, uh, but you can have people have those things and not be great traders. Uh, but I mean, some of the things were kind of obvious. They're all disciplined people. They all had uh, risk management, very good risk management. And doesn't mean they always had risk. Like Marcus, like I say, made a million risk management mistakes early on, but but when he became successful, he, that's that was important. So um, they had a lot of elements of patience in many cases. Oh, one thing that probably every great trader has, I think, It'd be very difficult for somebody to be a really good trader if they didn't have this trait, is the ability to really be flexible to change your mind. You got to be able to say, you know, you know, in an instant, I'm wrong. That's the next I'm, question. Yeah, Thank okay. you. I want you to read it. Yeah, right. A trait that is a central great trait, the ability to be flexible. Exactly. We're going to go next to it. Yeah, yeah. So that's no, that that is really, really critical. Uh, so if you're the type of person whose opinion is like can't be changed, uh, if you're because just rigorous, right. you know, you, odds are you'll be a terrible trader. You just have to be able to. Good traders are just they've got no loyalty. They're just willing to change. Fantastic phrase. I wanted to read to the people, and I want you to go deep in it because I, I, that's exactly what I always say. By the way, uh, uh, Richard Davis in a, a Turtle Way book said one thing when they ask him a question and then the, it's going to be the next question when they ask him a question uh, who you think can be a trader he said there's a, two things in love first of all the person has to know how to work properly second of all he's got to be adequate which is equal flexibility so the question is it says in your book a trade that this is essential for great traders is the ability to be flexible yeah yeah so i just said basically yes that's that's exactly right yeah